Tonight's subject is Imagining Creates Reality. And I mean this literally. We're told that God is the only creator. So if I make the claim that imagining creates reality, I am identifying God with man's own wonderful human imagination. God the creator is like pure imagining in ourselves. He works in the very depths of our soul, underlying all of our faculties, including perception, but he streams into our surface mind, least disguised in the form of creative fancy, D. Fawcett. That is a daydream. We can catch him in the act of creating, yet it is my very self, for I am imagining. And if what I'm imagining I do not forget, and then as time goes on it comes to pass in my world, then I have found him. I have found the source of creation in my world. I have found the one who creates. So tonight, this is my subject. Imagining creates reality. And because God is the only creator, if I can imagine a state and bring it to pass, then I have found him. Now remember his name is I am forever and forever, X314. So I'm imagining, well, who is? I am. Well, that's he, that's God. Don't forget it so that I may discover who he is. If I imagine and then go my way and forget what I did, I may not recognize my own harvest when I reap it in my world. It may be good, bad, or indifferent. But when I reap it, forgetting how I did it, I haven't found it. So this is tonight's story. You don't have to be rich to travel, but you must be imaginative to travel. You could have all of the wealth of the world and remain in a little hut, afraid of tomorrow's need, and have nothing but a vivid, wonderful imagination and travel the world over. Not just in what the world would say, your imagination, but objectively, as the world will call it reality. For all things exist in your own wonderful human imagination. Now let me tell you a story that I know quite well. The lady is my age, approximately my age, maybe a few years one way or the other. This happened when she was 16. She lived in Northern California. She was devoted to her father, and he lived high, wide, and handsome. No member of the family, including his wife, knew anything concerning his income. He just supplied all of their needs and supplied it well. Then he was killed. I did not press her to tell me how he was killed, but he was killed. She was 16. Overnight they discovered they had nothing. And the mother said, I could not stand the environment laughing at us, ridiculing us, so let us move to San Diego. With the little that they had, they moved to San Diego. This girl, who is today a truly great artist, she had no outside of her artistic talents. She didn't know what she could do to earn a dollar outside of waiting on tables. So she got a job as a waitress and it's now Christmas Eve she's riding home on an open streetcar it's raining the car is loaded with lovely boys and girls going home for Christmas with their last-minute purchases and they're singing and having the most marvelous time and she cannot restrain the tears luckily for her it's raining so she sticks her face into the heavens and mingles the rain with her tears and the salt of her tears she tasted then instantly she said to herself and this is what she did she transformed the entire scene while holding the rail at the back of the open car which is simply a conveyance she said this is not a street car this is a ship and i am not tasting my tears i am tasting the salt of the sea and the wind she rode home actually living in a certain mental state that she was on a ship moving into Samoa. She rode the entire journey holding that rail as though the rail were the rail of a ship and the salt of the sea was driven inward to her face by the wind and at the very end she was coming. 
she felt it was a moonlight night and she heard someone say to her, isn't it a heavenly night? We're coming into the bay, Manono, bay. And then the car came to the end. Two weeks later, she received a letter from Chicago from a law firm. They enclosed a check for $3,000 and said that her aunt, before she left for Switzerland two years ago, had deposited with them a certain sum of money with instructions that should she not return or should she die in the interval that $3,000 must be paid to this niece of hers. Within one month, she was on a ship sailing for Samoa. And coming into the bay, she saw this wonderful ship plowing through the waves like a lady with a bone in her mouth. You know the nautical term, a ship plowing through the waves and that lovely white foam that it makes. They speak of it as a bone in the lady's mouth. There she was drinking in the entire scene when an officer on deck said to her, isn't this a heavenly night? Exactly as she had visualized it and used her inner senses to make it real. Now, imagination, I said, creates reality. Imagination is spiritual sensation. By that I mean that she took her five senses, sight, sound, scent, taste, and touch, and transformed this car into a ship in the South Pacific. And within one month, she had realized it. Now others would say, well, that's just coincidence. May I tell you, I could repeat it thousands of times. It is not coincidence. This is reality, but man will not believe it. Man will not believe that God became man, that man may become God. He will not believe that God and man are one. That man is all imagination. And God is man and exists in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. Blake Anot. To Berkeley, Leo Koan. There is no other God. In the end, we will come out as an awakened being an awakened imagination, where all things are subject to us, for we know who we are. If imagining creates reality, it doesn't really matter what the present moment displays. It could only be the outpicturing of a certain imaginal act. Well, I will arrest that imaginal act and change it within myself. Well, how do I change it? Does scripture suggest it? Yes in the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Arise and go down to the potter's house and I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. The image in this hand was misshapen, but he reworked it into another image as it seemed good to him to do. Verses one, four. Now, the word translated potter means imagination. In the 64th chapter of Isaiah, we are told that the Lord is not only my father, he is the potter, and I am the clay in his hand. He is the potter. Now, I stand here and I begin to think of the day, and I think, well now, I got a number of letters today, and this is what they said. So I am now thinking over what they said. Or, suppose I was in business, and the boss said to me, you know, you're not doing as you ought to do. And I'm dwelling upon what he said. I am forming an image of myself based upon what he said. That's not the image I want. That is something that is misshapen. I'm not going to discard myself because he said that of me. I'll take the same thing and reshape it as it seemed good to me to do. So he said this, that, or the other. I will not accept that. I will reshape myself into the image that I wish he had described me. Describe me in this manner rather than the way he described me this day. So I will simply now reshape myself in this image. Will it work? Yes, try it. For the God of the universe is your own wonderful human imagination, shaping you morning, noon, and night. Well, you are accepting this, that, or the other, 
from a seeming without. No, do it from within. What do you want the world to see you? How do you want them to see you? How would you like them to describe you? Well now, describe yourself in that manner as though the world actually saw you in that light and believe it. Walk in the assumption that this thing is true. And may I tell you, no power in the universe can thwart it because no power can thwart God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. So I tell you, imagining does create reality. Don't let anyone in the world tell you that you are something apart. You can't divide God. His name is I am. Try to divide it. You can't divide it. God is one. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Dut 6-4, not two. Well, if he's one and his name is I am, well, that's God. Let me now, without looking at the outside world, define myself as I would like to be in this world and live it as I would like to live it in this world. Well, now, let me define it. Let me believe it without waiting for the evidence of my senses to confirm it. They will deny it at the moment of my attempt to define myself in this light. They'll deny it. But just like this lady, 16 years old, no money, weeping, and she transformed it. Being an artist, she simply lost herself in this state. Now you may say, but she did have an aunt who left 3,000. Your reasoning mind comes in. And then the aunt had the presence of mind to die. And therefore she got the $3,000. And being young, she simply took off without considering the future and had this heavenly time in the South Pacific. That's what reason will tell us. But I tell you, that's how this law works. It never fails. If you will go all out and live in it, your own wonderful human imagination is God, and there is nothing but God. And because God cannot die, he's the God of the living. When this little garment comes to its end, regardless of how it comes to its end, you, the living being, cannot die. You survive anything that happens to you in this world, but you will still be in a world just like this until you reach the end when you awake from the dream of life. When you awake from the dream of life, then you are an entirely different, you're in an entirely different age, and you realize the oneness of being who you really are. Until then, believe what I am telling you. It is true, and it will never fail you. A few weeks ago, a friend of ours, who is here tonight, told us, and I told you the story, he took his barber from the low man on a totem pole. He was fourth in the barber shop. And when he discovered, while sitting in his chair, that he did like to barber, and he was not ashamed of it, he loved it. He said, all right, you really love it? I'll take you up. In his mind's eye, he saw him at the very top of his profession. In the not distant future, he bought out the store, replaced the owner. He became owner and the number one and changed and rearranged the other three. A few weeks ago in San Francisco, my friend imagined that he had won a prize. He not only won the first, he won a second. And two of the three barbers who worked for him won second. They came back from San Francisco with four prizes out of nine that were given for the state. He learned that there was another test coming up for barbers for the 11 Western states. And he imagined that he saw the trophy on the wall that he would get. Didn't burst a blood vessel to make it so. He just saw in his mind's eye the trophy there, implying this barber won the first prize in the 11 Western states. A week ago last Saturday, when he had his hair cut, he walked in to find a seven foot trophy and the man told him he also received $1,000 plus the trophy. 
He won the contest held at the Biltmore of the 11 Western states in cutting the hair of men. He took him from the low man on the totem pole to this state. No wonder he wrote me the story of that long procession of people he's healing one after the other. And the healing was not all physical. In fact, the minority were physical healings. I'm telling him right now, you're blessed, blessed beyond measure, that you can do this for the seeming other. It's not another, it's yourself. And you will go to the very top by continuing to use your imaginative power for the seeming other. There is no other. Hear what they need, what they would like, and then you simply, in your own wonderful way, as you're trained, do it and let it take place in your world. For everyone that comes to pass, you go up, oh, beyond measure. Without asking anything for self, you go beyond and beyond and beyond in this world. This is how this law works. You don't have to sit down and burst a blood vessel for oneself because the whole vast world is yourself pushed out. What do you want? You do? Well, now I will hear it for you. Don't ask beyond that moment. I will hear it for you and then go. A friend of mine who is here tonight told me Saturday night. He said, Neville, you may tell this story from the platform. I had hesitated to tell it until I got his permission. I was in Barbados when this thing happened in New York City. His mother pleaded with him to come to New York City because of a tragedy in the family. And he figured, if only I could find Neville. This is before he had the birth. He wouldn't do it today because he has been born from above and he's found David the son of God who called him father. But this was before the birth. If only I could find Neville, I know that I would ask it of him and I would listen to whatever he said. The mother called him back and said, you've got to come. Well, the problem was the brother who was a tender, undoubtedly a tender, loving, gentle fellow. I'd trust him implicitly. As I said to him Saturday night, I think your mother must be a darling. Really, she must be a sweetheart from all that you've told me. But we are a family, and when something happens, we all pull together to protect any injured member of that family. What happened to his brother? To cause the violence for one moment doesn't really matter. But in that moment of violence, he killed a man. Well, we need not go into detail. He killed a man, didn't deny it. And then the mother called and said, you must come. He said, I know, but Neville is in Barbados, so they say. But I had a dream. It was more than a dream. It was a vision. A woman said to me in my vision, if you find Neville, he will give you the rainbow in the sky if you find him. So I knew I had to find you. So I thought, I'll take a chance and call you. He called me when we just got into the house back from Barbados, before he was taking off for New York City. And when he told me the story, I said, forget it, it's done. God is infinite mercy, nothing but forgiveness of sin. I don't care what a man does. When the spirit of Christ is formed in you, you forgive everything in this world. There's nothing you don't forgive. I don't care what it is. The most horrible thing in the world, you forgive it. He hardened Pharaoh's heart not to let his people go. How can you condemn Pharaoh? That is the story. And so I said, it's done. And he and I over the phone heard each other. His request and my bold assertion, I have heard it, it's done. Well, this past two weeks, the mother called to say he has been set free. I did not ask him Saturday night. I will never ask him why he did it, how he did it. It makes no difference to me whatsoever. For I'm gonna tell you, 
Not one of us in this world, when we reach the end, can say we have not killed someone. You play every part in this world, but every part. No one escapes playing that part, so that in the end, you will forgive all, because you've done it yourself. When memory returns at the end of the journey, you have played every part in the world. You've been a thief, a murderer, everything that you can think of. And there is not one little thing that man could ever do that isn't recorded in scripture. To fulfill scripture, you had to play all the parts. Had I not played everything in scripture, I could not have been born from above. Had he, who so loves his brother and couldn't understand how his brother could ever have done it, I will tell him, he did the same thing. We've all done it. We have murdered, we have stolen, we have done everything in this world that today the world condemns. And when we reach the end of the journey and the spirit of Christ is formed within us, which is continual forgiveness of sin, we see no one that we can condemn. It's one of those things. You don't have to go out and try to publicize it to get an office in this world, to say I'm against war. No, that's not it at all. They are still capable of murder, those who are saying it. That's not it. You've done it. And having done it, it's not that you're indifferent to it, but the whole vast world is a play, and God is playing all the parts. So you realize who you really are, the author of the whole play, and you're playing every part in the world. But tonight, we want to be right down here on this level. Take everyone here. You don't have to abide by anything that is now taking place that you dislike. What you now dislike is the vessel in your hand that is not properly shaped. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel in his hand was spoiled, but he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to him to do. You don't only rework your own concept of yourself into a new concept, but you rework everyone in your world into a new concept. This one can't get a job. This one doesn't make enough to pay expenses in this world. Well, these are concepts that are not right. You take everyone and you rework it in your mind's eye. Now you don't break any blood vessel. To make it so, you simply do it in your mind's eye and you actually feel what it is to having witnessed it or having heard it in some way. For an idea that is only an idea doesn't do anything, it produces nothing. It must produce in you motor elements. It must. I must in some way act within myself when I entertain an idea. So you call me up or write me and you make a request. I can't read the letter and then drop it. If I'm going to do something, I must act upon it. The idea that I act upon must produce in me a motor element. The motor element may be picking up the telephone receiver in my imagination and hearing your voice. And you tell me, thank you, I have it, it's all done. Or it could be picking up another letter where now in the next letter, you tell me that you have it. Or it could be meeting you in the flesh and embracing you and you tell me that you have it I will not know what I will do, but I will do something that is a motor. It's a motion within me. And this takes the idea from just being an idea into a creative state. And it never fails, may I tell you. It will not fail you. A plain idea, just an idea doesn't work. It must produce in me or in you or in anyone who would bring it to pass that motor element. The very first creative act, as recorded in scripture, and the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. Genova 1, 2, it's motion. I stand here and I would like to be elsewhere. Well now, I close my eyes to the obvious and then I see the world as I would see it if I were elsewhere. 
That's motion. Yet I open my eyes, and I am still here. But I went and prepared the place. That is motion. That's psychological motion. So I stand here, and I desire something which, if it came to pass, would find me elsewhere, spatially. Well, now, I close my eyes to the obvious. I assume that I am there and make there here. Therefore, here vanishes. This room vanishes as I make that place here. Then I look at the world and see it as it is related to the new position that I am now occupying. I feel the reality of this state. So I've moved. I move from where I am now to where I want to be. This is creativity. Now, it doesn't make sense, but man hasn't tried it. That's why Douglas Fawcett said, the secret of imagining is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which every mystic aspires. For supreme power, supreme wisdom, and supreme delight lie in the solution of this far off mystery. How to completely control this mystery, to unravel it, you mean it is all in me? Yes, in my own wonderful human imagination. How to move from here to the ends of the earth? Well, all I have to do is imagine that I am at that point in space. How will I know that I am actually there? Then mentally look at the world. Look at the world mentally. If you assume that you are elsewhere, then look at the world and see the world as it's related to that position in space that you are assuming that you have occupied. Mr. Hoover made the statement at the convention in San Francisco when he addressed the GOP. I think the year was 1958. No, 1960. I know because he sent me a copy of his address and requested a copy of my book, Awakened Imagination. Now, when that came out, I do not know but that was what he requested. He sent me his autograph message. This is what he said. Human history, with its many forms of government, its revolutions, its wars. In fact, the rise and fall of nations could be written in terms of the rise and fall of ideas implanted in the minds of men. Now, here is our late president, Herbert Hoover. If the change of government is but the result of the change of ideas implanted in the minds of men, can you see what we are doing today in planting the horrors of the world? We go home and turn on TV or radio or read the morning paper, and no headline would be a headline unless it scared you. It has to scare you in order to really attract your attention. If tomorrow morning you saw a headline and some prominent person is dead or murdered, that's better, you buy the paper. But see a headline, things are all right now. You go blindly on, means nothing. Read some scandal of some prominent person, you stop and you buy the paper. Now that's our entire system. Well, the rise and fall of nations could be written in terms of the rise and fall of ideas implanted in the minds of men. Now that is true, that is scripture. He wrote it in his own marvelous way. It's all recorded, for all his words are recorded and they are on record. If I really want this country to survive and go beyond what it is now, I should be very careful what ideas I'm implanting in the minds of our citizens. And when we allow everything, and we have to allow it, but we encourage it. Allow it, but don't encourage the horrors in order to sell a paper or to sell toothpaste or something else. For the entire thing is imagining creates reality. Believe it or not, it's true. And if we want to live in this wonderful land of ours and go to the very top and enjoy it fully, well then, when you meet someone, no matter what he tells you, put a new idea in its place. Just the negative, and just put something that is lovely in its place. Just put it aside. If you have time, then show him why you're doing it, 
and tell him why you're doing it. If he cannot believe you, without his consent, without his knowledge, when you are alone, think of him and imagine he is telling you what you would like him to tell you. It's your privilege because you want a world that is not disturbed by his strange, stupid, negative state. And so he will not believe it. And when it happens to him in the world as something lovely, he will never know that you were the source of the lovely things that happened to him. You know it, but you need not crow. Leave him alone. He'll go through not knowing the harvest that he's reaping. For I send you to reap whereon you did not sow. John 4, 38. But I send these out to sow. And when you know it, no matter what they do, you do the lovely thing. If you do not falter, these lovely things will come into harvest in your world. And we will all reap the benefits. Believe it. Here is a child of 16. Now she never heard me. I did not meet this lady Dora, Dora, until 1945 in San Francisco. This happened many, many years before. So she was not influenced by anything I said. She simply, to get away from it all, did this. And here, the salt tears are coming down and she simply began to transform them into the salt of the sea brought to her by the wind. Then the little rail, she transformed that into a rail of a ship. Then everything about it she made real. And then came the $3,000 check. In those days, it would be worth today's $6,000. She simply went off to her Samoa and had the most heavenly time for quite a long while. But she never forgot that she, in this moment of despair, imagined a state. And it worked that way. So I'm asking everyone here to try it. Don't pray to any God on the outside because he isn't there at all. Turn to no object in space as God. There is no God on the outside. The God is invisible. When you say I am, you think of the face that you're wearing and you say, well, I am John, I am Mary, I am Jan, I am this. That's only a mask. But you'll know who you really are when God's only begotten son, David, stands before you and calls you father. He looks into this perfect being that you really are and calls you father. Then you know who you are. He doesn't call you Neville or John or Peter or Jan or Mary. He calls you father. You are the invisible God and he is the express image of the invisible God. So he's being formed, he's already formed, and when, in you, you reach the end of the journey, he explodes, or you explode, and he stands before you. And here is David of biblical fame. He looks right into your face, and you've never known such love, such affection, just something that you can't describe in words. You love people here. Yes, you certainly do. But when you look at David, you can't describe your love and your devotion to this David and his love for you. He sees you as this eternal father. He calls you father. And then the journey is at an end. In the meanwhile, you'll tell it to everyone who will listen to you. And so that you set everyone free in the world. Are you unemployed? All right. Tell me that you are gainfully employed beyond what you thought you could ever earn. Just tell me mentally. You are now not well. Well, now you tell me mentally that you never felt better and you are lonely. Tell me you've never known such company and such affection and such devotion. And you tell me. And then having heard it all, you walk as though you heard it. So this subjective appropriation of your objective, hope for this, that, or the other. And you walk never turning back, never questioning the reality of what you've done, and it all comes to pass. Then you have found him. I have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. Who? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, 
Who is he? He is the Lord. He is God the Father. I have found him. I have found the source of the phenomena of life, that what I did not know in the past, and all these things were happening to me, it was caused by the same source. There is only one source. There aren't two gods, only one. But I didn't know there was only one. I thought there was God and some strange thing in the distance. Now a lady wrote me this. She said, I had the strangest vision, the most horrible, horrible experience. Hear this being said to me in the most, well, I would not even use the word. She said, I'm ashamed even to put it in print to you. You've never known such a curse in your life. And the word was named on your head. Well, I could hardly believe that someone could so curse me. And I said, why? The same being replied, because I want you. Now she says, I could hardly believe that someone could so want me. I can accept that they want me, yes, but want me and still could curse me to that extent. The thought that came to me after the whole thing was over is the word because. I can understand them wanting me, their curse, which to me is beyond measure. The curse was horrible. But why? Because I want you. I'll tell you why. When you go home, you read the third chapter, the 10th through the 14th verses of Galatians. Let me summarize Galatians for you. Galatians. And Paul is now speaking for you and for everyone who has arrived at the point where you have. Paul is stating for everyone who arrives at that point of complete rejection of all authorities, institutions, customs and laws that would interfere with the direct contact of the individual with his God. And when one cannot, may I tell you, I know it from experience, for in my visions, churches, organized churches, organized societies, organized politics, they are all personified. Everything is human in eternity. Rivers, mountains, cities, everything is human. For God is man. Thou art a man, God is no more. Thine own humanity learn to adore. Blake, Everlasting Gospel. So everything, even this building, is personified. And it has, it's a person when you meet it in the spirit world. What it represents. If it represents greed of the ladies who operate here, you will see in it that person. If you try to detach yourself from it, it will curse you, for they want to feed on you. And so, you got out of institutions, religious institutions, organizations, customs and laws that would interfere with you, the individual, with your wonderful direct approach to your God, and it lost you, so it cursed you. It has no power whatsoever, none whatsoever. Leave it alone. You do not fight with these shadows. I encounter them all the time. When I first saw this horrible, monstrous thing, talk about the witches in Macbeth, why they're like little children, compared to this monster that I first encountered in the cave, teaching the little children the black arts, the arts of hurting, of murder, of everything. As I stood at the opening of that cave and she screamed, the screech in her voice didn't affect me at all. She said, oh man of God, what have you to do with me? Always the same story of the Bible. These spirits, they're only personifications of organizations. And there are those who teach the black arts, those who teach how to hurt people, those who would control your mind and make you feel dependent upon them to contact God. And God is within you. He's not without. So, my dear, you are blessed when you heard the curse. They are helpless to do anything to you, completely helpless. But when you see them, you don't realize that they only are personifications of institutions, of organizations, of customs and of laws. So you need not tell me the actual word. You've told me in the way you tried to, 
without putting it down on paper. But I know from my own experience how this works, and they are perfectly helpless, because I move through these worlds night after night on my father's work. And not one can touch you. You have completely rejected any interference between you and God. You need no intermediary. For you were raised in a very orthodox religious group, and they would enslave you for the rest of eternity if they could. But man leaves it one by one. We all leave it one by one. And they will curse, but their curse means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Now to come back to tonight's theme, imagining creates reality. You could imagine, what are you imagining? To say to me, well, I imagined it and it hasn't worked. I will say to you, then what are you now imagining? Have you forgotten that you are John Brown? You were not born knowing that you are John Brown. You were born and suddenly you began to be called John. Then you began to assume that you are John when they told you that you are John Brown. So when you heard the name John, you responded. No matter where you were in the world, you responded. Now you say, I am secure, I am wanted. Have you forgotten it? Have you worn it long enough to know that you are? If you say, I once imagined it, what are you doing saying, I once imagined it and not now, still imagining it? So I imagined it, so to be. I am still imagining it, so to be. I will continue to imagine that it is until that which I am. Imagining is outpictured in my world. And that's how we operate this law. In the end, you will awaken and you are God. Now let us go into the silence.